Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to the Garden Home, where you'll find lots of practical ideas, beautiful landscapes, and all the inspiration you'll need to push the boundaries of your home right out into the garden, to the edges of your property. Now in today's show, we're going to focus on an important and eye-catching aspect of the Garden Home, and that's the entry. You know, I think it's really important for an entry to say, welcome. After all, it's like the front door of your garden. That's why when I design a garden home, I always try to accent an entry, whether it be with a beautiful gate, an arbor, or even planters that punctuate the entrance. You see, I think the allure of an entry is that it's an important point of transition, a place where change occurs. This is the place where people move from the public space into your private world or enclave, helping to set the mood and style of your garden home. It's an important design element that helps unify your house and garden. Now think about this for just a minute. We've all probably been to someone's house where we were baffled which way to go in terms of the entry. You look over there, you see the entrance to the front door, but there's no path to get there. So you think, well, I'll go through the garage, only to find yourself in a sea of cars and boxes. You see, everyone appreciates a well-defined entrance, and that should start in the garden, well before you get to the front porch or the front door. You just use this area as a way to roll out your own red carpet. I've noticed that over the years that there are some signature elements that announce, enter here. Piers, gates, and paths, for example, serve as directional guides. Plants can help define an entry. A large pair of shrubs at the beginning of a walkway tell the visitor, this is the way. Now this notion of creating a sense of entry into a garden space is just one of the 12 principles of design that I use when I create or design a garden. You see, I believe that when you take these 12 principles and you work them together where they can interact with one another and you can create a sense of harmony, then you've got a beautiful and compelling garden. Now, for instance, this entry into my side garden embraces another principle of design, frame the view. See how the arbor frames the view of the garden spaces beyond. Another of the 12 principles is enclosure. And no garden should be without a little fantasy, a touch of the whimsical. So don't forget about whimsy. And of course, there's mystery, which can lead us to surprise. And then there's color one of the most exciting of the principles, which runs a close second to the principle of texture, pattern, and rhythm for creating dramatic visual interest. And then there's focal point, which can be defined as any object you use in a garden to focus on. To really grab your attention in this part of my garden, I've used this bold variegated agave. Even color can serve as a focal point, red being the most arresting to the eye. Notice how these red geraniums really cause you to focus on them. It's also important as another principle to recognize the shape and forms of plants, just as understanding how the principle of time impacts the garden from season to season and year to year. And I must say, abundance can make a garden feel full and satisfying, so be generous when you plant. And then, last but certainly not least, is the idea or principle of structure. And it can present itself in many ways. A fence, an arbor like this, or even buildings in the garden. Now this litany of 12 principles that I've just been through has served me well over the years. You see, it's helped me to organize my thinking. The 12 principles help the garden design process from being too overwhelming for me. Now another approach I try to take to keep the design process from being too much is to divide and conquer, a space that is. Rather than taking on the entire yard, I divide it into spaces or garden rooms, if you will. And these rooms are analogous to the rooms in my home. 
They have walls, floors, and furnishings. Here you can see this needlepoint holly hedge serves as the wall to this garden. And I've used brick and gravel to create the floor. And there are furnishings for us to enjoy the space. Now let's get back to this idea or principle of entry. You see, it's an important one, and most of us accent the entry to our homes every day without really giving much thought to it. It can be as simple as a doormat that says welcome, or a container of seasonal flowers. You see, front and back entries are often given the most attention, but passageways in and out of garden rooms are equally important. As we move from one area to the next, each point of transition is an opportunity to create a distinctive threshold. These internal entries are also places to build some continuity in the garden. You see, by repeating some of the same materials or architectural elements you find in your house in the entry's design, you continue to support this sense of continuity between your house and your garden. Now let's take a look at some of the entries in my garden home, starting with the fountain garden. Now this garden room gets a double take with these two mirror entries. Remember how I mentioned it's good to use building materials found in the house's architecture? Well, I use the column motif of my turn of the century colonial revival styled house. In the spring, the arbors are covered with Frau Karl Druski, which was introduced about the same time as the house, around 1905. And arbors aren't the only entries in my garden that I accent. Over my tool shed, I enjoy Lamarck, another old-fashioned favorite of mine. While roses certainly are fast growers, sometimes I want to get dramatic results in a hurry. So I resort to vines to help me out until the roses can get up and over whatever I'm growing them on. The moonflower is a good example. These seeds are large and look like raisins covered in white chocolate, and just a few can have a dramatic effect. Before this rose bush was mature enough to grow up and over the entry to my tool shed, I used moonflower, and I have to say the results were pretty sensational. The vine covered this area with its heart-shaped leaves, beautiful white flowers, and interesting seed pods in only a few months. The sweet fragrance alone of the large white flowers make this plant worth growing. Now another annual vine that can grow with equal vigor is the morning glory. This cousin to the moon vine will shower your garden with flowers until the first cold nights of autumn. Each year I also try to include some of the old-fashioned hyacinth bean vine. This year I'm going to plant it on a trellis, but in the past I've planted it in combination with some of my large shrub roses. Creating a sensation in your garden doesn't require a lot of time or money. With these annual flowering vines, it's as close as a packet of seed. The walkway to my front door is very apparent, thanks to several accents. You see, a picket fence and gate start the transition from the street to garden. Large clip boxwoods accent the entry. These boxwoods are echoed inside the fence just before the steps leading up to my front porch. And in the Rondell garden, you can see the oval-shaped hedge has been accented at the entry by scalloping the boxwoods. Now there's another area in my garden where a sense of entry is important. It's this transition space between the shade garden here and the service area back here. Now the service area is really analogous to the utility room in the house. And as you might imagine, it's not always the tidiest, so I wanted to come up with a way to screen it, but at the same time create sort of a celebrated, fanciful entry. So I put up this picket fence with a pair of gates, but I soon realized that wasn't quite enough. I wanted to screen out even more, so I created this clipped hornbeam arch. Now this idea isn't a new one. It's one that I discovered on a trip to Holland when I visited the palace Het Low. This is a superb restoration of a 17th century garden. And the design is so elaborate, you might say it's fit for a king. For Holland, it's a very large uh, restoration. And it was decided to restore the palace in uh, the Baroque style, in the style of the 17th and 18th century, and also of the style in which it was built originally by William, King William III. And the architect who did the restoration, he said, well, if I restore a Baroque palace, 
I should also restore the garden because otherwise it's only half a job because in the Baroque time the garden and the palace were one unit. They Absolutely. belonged to, together. Right. The exterior and interior yes. worked in harmony. Yes. Tell me a little bit about the way this garden was actually reconstructed because um, I think in the 19th century this was a, a very different place, wasn't it? Yeah, this in the 19th century was a, a what we call a landscape garden, English landscape garden. In the early 19th century, Louis Napoleon, the brother of Napoleon, uh, lived in this palace and a geometrical garden like this was old fashioned at that time. So he had hit the, the, the whole swept garden. Away. Well, swept away, swept over. He had that <laughs> filled it up. And before we started restoration, we did try excavations to find where the foundations of the fountains. And so there was a great deal of archaeology. There was a great deal of archaeology, yes. Yeah, and for instance, one of the steps of the uh, terraces was found and all little details. I think one of the most striking things to me about this garden is the, the embankment of turf that goes around three sides of it. Yes, well that's exceptional for Dutch gardens because most of the time, because there's so much water in Holland, most of the times the gardens are surrounded by canals. But this part of uh, Holland is not very, uh, there's not much water and it was in William's time, there, was, uh, there wasn't all the woods which are there now, but it was mainly sand and, and heather. And they were probably built to keep the sand out. I see. And another advantage was, of course, when you walk on the terraces, you have a good view on the parterres and on the layout of the garden. Yes, I think these 17th century landscapes are, are better appreciated if you can look down on them. On it, yes, right. yes. Yeah. That's, that's why here, for instance, from the roof of the palace, you have a very good view of the garden. Gardens of this design and scale require tremendous resources of money and labor to maintain. Of course, you also needed a wide expanse of flattened land to create these interesting patterns and shapes. This was a place where the king could show off a bit, entertain guests and heads of state, they would marvel at its magnificence. But even with all of this exuberance, a visitor like me can always take away ideas that I can use in my small garden. Among the magnificent plantings, parterre gardens, and incredible fountains was this clipped bower made of European hornbeam. It was designed so Queen Mary and her court could enjoy walking in the garden without getting sunburned. You know, I really enjoy visiting grand gardens like Het Lo because it seems like I always come away with the seed of an idea that I can apply in my own garden home. And that's just what I did here with this pleached hornbeam arch. You see there, they use European hornbeam and I've used the American version. And even though they're deciduous in that they lose their leaves in the winter, they make excellent hedges. You see this being used more and more in this country. Now, I don't have a problem taking a formal element like this and introducing it into a garden design. I like the contrast between the formal and the informal. It heightens visual interest. Interior designers use this device frequently by taking a formal antique, perhaps, and introducing it into a more relaxed, casual setting. Now, the concept here is really simple. I started with four trees, two on each side of the entry gate and I clipped all the limbs on these single trunk trees up to about four and a half feet. From there, I simply trimmed the limbs, the hedge part of the pleaching, in one plane. So I clipped everything off the sides and encouraged limbs to knit together here at the crest of the arch, making a dramatic entry. <music> This is the north entry to my garden home. It's the one that gets the most foot traffic. 
through the arbor, across the lawn, up onto the loggia. It's an important space, so I wanted to come up with something special for this area. So I designed this arbor, and I wanted to grow a rose over it, so I chose New Dawn as the rose of choice. And in just five short years, it completely covered this arbor. Now, it doesn't look like much today because it's late summer and it's only blooming a little, but I want to take you back to last spring when this rose was a real showstopper. Every once in a while, I come across a plant I want everyone to know about. Maybe it's because it's easy to care for or it's exceptionally beautiful. Well, this plant epitomizes all of those characteristics. This is the New Dawn Rose. Now, you may be one of those people who say, I couldn't possibly grow a rose because they're too fussy. Well, this is the plant for you. You see, my New Dawn gets very little if no care throughout the season, and it blooms until the first cold days of fall. I like this rose because the color of the blooms are pale pink, so they'll go with just about any color scheme. And the flowers are mildly fragrant, and boy, do they bloom. New Dawn is a vigorous climber that can grow up to 20 feet, so they're perfect for growing on fences or using on a trellis. New Dawn isn't considered one of those old-fashioned or heritage varieties of roses, even though it was introduced in the 1930s. However, it still maintains some of those exceptional qualities the old-fashioned roses have, such as a slight fragrance. It's easy to care for, and it's low maintenance. Just take a look at these dark green glossy leaves. They just seem to be naturally resistant to pests and other problems, and that's a nice change. If you really love roses, but you're not into maintenance, you should give one of these a try. Just make sure you give it plenty of sun and lots of room to grow. Another great thing about New Dawn Rose is that it can work in so many different situations and so many different styles. You can either dress it up or dress it down. Just look how it accents this beautiful entryway. Now the great thing about New Dawn is that it continues to bloom. Here we are in early fall and it's still throwing off beautiful flowers. You know the great thing about climbing roses is that they can take an entry and transform it into something special if not just downright magical. This is just one of the many beautiful entries here at Old Westbury Gardens on Long Island in New York. Old Westbury was the family home of John S. Phipps, his wife, Margarita Grace Phipps, and their four children. The home was built in 1906 by the English designer George A. Crawley. It's a magnificent Charles II style mansion that's nestled on 160 acres of formal gardens, landscape grounds, woodlands, ponds, and lakes. During my visit to the estate, I learned a little more about the history and many of the entries on the property. Well, I have to say I'm very impressed with the wrought iron and the gates here at Old Westbury Gardens. The uh, entrance gates in particular are really something. Uh, it sets the tone for the visitor, um, really brings them in and, and shows them what this is going to be like. Well, <laughs> <laughs> they do promise great things and the house and gardens certainly deliver. Uh, thank you. We kind of, kind of uh, agree with that. Um, the entrance gates in particular are historic. They were made by Robert Bakewell, who was the famous, uh, now famous, uh, English um, artisan who created them in yes, the early the 1700s. Century. Yes. Yep, yep. Yes. And uh, the other wrought iron gates on the property, while they cannot be exactly attributed to him, are certainly in his style. Yes. Very, very classical in nature, somewhat ornate, but not overpoweringly so. The Englishman Robert Bakewell has made his mark on history, as has an American craftsman, Philip Simmons, whose handcrafted wrought iron graces the entries of many homes in Charleston, South Carolina, and he's earned a coveted place in the Smithsonian. We visited Mr. Simmons' century-old workshop one cold and rainy day, guided by Mr. Simmons' friend, Rossi Coulter. Hey, Mr. Simmons. Hey, Mr. Coulter, how you doing? Fine, I'm catching you working here. Yes. I thought you were retired. Yes. Was someone retired? I, if I had seen you coming, I wouldn't be beating on this iron. 
you want to, we have some visitors here today and we want to talk about you know how you got into the business. I came here from Daniels Island, 1920, when I came here. When I came here, I didn't come on a plane, bus, train. You know how I got here? On the boat. There's no bridges here around here. And how old were you when you went to the shop the first time? Eight years old. So he told you he'd come back when? When you 13, come back. That was the hiring age for a kid then. And you know, I was 13 on a Wednesday, and Thursday I was in here. I enjoy my work too, as well as the customer. The work of Philip Simmons can be seen all over Charleston, and the legacy of his work will live on through those he has taught and through the Philip Simmons Foundation, dedicated to preserving the work of this American craftsman. I can understand the pride Philip Simmons feels when he walks around Charleston and sees his gates being used. I get that same feeling when I visit the gardens I've helped to design. You know, there's something about color that just seizes our imagination. For me, it just draws me in. It's the perfect accent for an entry. Just look at this wonderful coleus called Tilt-A-Whirl. It's one of my favorites. Just look at the rich variety of hues in the leaves. Now, you don't have to have a lot of space to enjoy color like this. I designed two containers, one for sun and one for shade, that are full of lots of color, and they're perfect for accenting an entry. Now both of these combinations follow my simple container recipe, and that's using a tall and spiky element in the center, something round and full in the middle, and for that finishing touch, cascading plants to spill over the edge. Now this sun container starts with a dracaena or spike in the middle, as well as a tall sage or salvia called purple rain. To fill in, I use the wishbone plant or terrenia. Now this variety is called Duchess Deep Blue, which makes a dramatic statement, as does the Agaranthemum Comet Pink there behind it. Cascading enthusiastically out of the containers this chartreuse sweet potato vine called Margarita, along with Leoni Royal Purple Verbena. Two accent containers round out the composition. One dish is full of terrenia, and the other I filled with asparagus fern. What a beautiful accent for a sunny entry. Now let's shift into the shade. For a shady entrance, you might try this composition. Just as in the sun container, I've used a spiky plant in the center. This one is a cordyline. I love its rich purpley foliage. Then I filled in with round and full plants, which include kiwi fern coleus and firefly impatience. Cascading plants soften the edge of the container, and here I've used blue fan flower, along with this gray-leafed helichrysum. Accenting an entry doesn't have to be an elaborate process. You see, it can be as simple as placing or planting some aromatic plants around an entryway. Just imagine the aroma of lilies or gardenias near an entryway, or certainly herbs like this wonderful scented geranium, or even rosemary. Now our pioneer ancestors certainly understood the benefit of this and how it could welcome guests to their home. Tina Marie Wilcox at the Ozark Folk Center tells us more. And what better way to landscape the front of an Ozark cabin than with Ozark native plants? Yes. Look at this calicarpa, it's beautiful. Calicarpa americana. So they did call it French mulberry because it looks so exotic. Oh, is that why? That's, that's why I think. I mean, yeah. but why would we give the credits elsewhere? <laughs> why give it to the French? That's it's right. an American native. That's it. So these, these berries are, are completely edible. A little yeah, sweet. Yeah, a little sweet. A little not starchy. Nothing makes you want to go off and bake a pie, though, does it? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> but they wanted to keep these away from the, the chickens because when hens, they believed that when hens would eat the berries, they would stop them from laying. Really? Yes. No more eggs. That's right. <laughs> what a terrible thing that would be. <laughs> really? <laughs> So Well, it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, you can see why they call it uh, beauty bush. Yes. Yeah, it's gorgeous. A great plant. And over here in front of the cabin, yet another American native plant. That's it, the mist flower. It's beautiful, perennial ageratum. 
does such a good job, except that it waits all the way until October to begin to bloom. Right, great fall perennial. Great, and it just takes a little start to get a big patch. You know, this is a, a plant that I think most homeowners, home gardeners would know as the as the ageratum they plant in the in the spring, but it's an annual. That's right. When they go to the nursery and buy the little six packs of annuals, it's a, it's a close cousin. But this one, of course, is perennial. It'll come back every year. That's right, and don't forget, it'll spread like a mint. Man, it's just unbelievable. Speaking of mint, looks like you've got some planted here by the cabin corner. We had to have it here because in an Ozark cabin way down in a holler you didn't get company very often <laughs> so you wanted to take care of them and welcome them when they came and so when the woman of the house would hear a company coming up the road she would send her littlest and out to beat the mint oh really and the fragrance <laughs> of the mint would fill the air and say welcome just as it did in Greece thousands of years ago I can smell it it works that's right symbol of hospitality In today's show, we've seen how entries serve as important points of transition and can be a reflection of our own personal style. But more important than that, we've seen how they can serve as guides into and through our gardens. I hope that much of what you've seen in today's show will help you as you examine the entries in your garden and home. From the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. One of the keys to creating a beautiful garden is to be generous with your plantings. So travel with me to England, where I'll share the inspiring sights of abundant plantings at Arley Hall's herbaceous border. I'll show you how to use this concept on a much smaller scale in our American gardens, even in containers. You won't want to miss it.